you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. He, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Emergency Ultrasound Podcast. I'm Matt Dawson. And I'm Mike Mallon, and uh, we've got a special treat for you this time. Dr. Dawson's going to talk to us about testicular ultrasound. Well, you know, Mike, the people have spoken. Uh, You know, we we had thought about doing a testicular ultrasound podcast for a while now, but people who know us and know our level of maturity recommended against it very strongly. You know, I've never actually considered doing a testicular ultrasound podcast. Uh, I actually think about it all the time. It's been, it's been a dream of mine for a while. But anyway, uh, uh, we, we actually have gotten quite a few questions about testicular ultrasound recently and how to do it and if you, we think it's appropriate for, for everybody to kind of be doing this or if this is more specialized and, and is a dangerous thing for us to get into. And so we're going to give you our thoughts on it and we're going to, uh, more than that, just kind of show you how to do it, show you some of the evidence and let you decide whether or not this is something that you should be doing in your practice or not. So let's start off, why exactly do ultrasound of the testicle? Well, a painful, swollen testicle could be a lot of things, and we're not going to go into the literature about how poor our history and physical are, but if you read any of the text, any of the major emergency ultrasound texts, they give you quite a few references as to how poor we are, distinguishing torsion from epididymitis, orchitis, and these are not things that we want to confuse one another because the treatment is obviously very different. And not something you want to mess up either. Like, sort of the last thing you want to do is get the wrong diagnosis on somebody's testicle. No, you're right. This is something that you don't want to get wrong. I mean, if you say somebody has epididymitis and it's actually torsion, then they're going to go home with their antibiotics and, and lose a testicle probably. So not something you want to be wrong on. So let's start off with a case. This is a 40-year-old SW... <laughs> who comes in with severe testicular pain after getting kicked in his man region over an argument with another ED physician about whether upstairs care really belonged downstairs. This is a made-up case. This did, this did not happen. And if it, it resembles anyone that you know, it is totally by accident and by complete coincidence. So what are you thinking here? What's on your differential diagnosis, Mike? Well, if, I mean, if he got kicked in the man region, I guess I'm, I'm worried about uh, maybe testicular rupture or, I mean, trauma obviously is, is what I'm concerned about. Um, I, I guess uh, rupture, or like a uh, traumatic torsion would be up there on my list. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the first thing you're thinking of, of course, are contusion and rupture, but this has been reported quite a bit, cases of people thinking that it's a rupture or contusion with all the pain, but it's pretty hard to evaluate someone with all that swelling, and cases of torsion have been missed in a situation. So what are you going to do? You're going to ultrasound them, right? I guess so. I mean, I, I might check a cremasteric reflex, which has probably got to be the most awkward test to perform in emergency medicine. Yeah, I try to st- just, just stay away from that one if I, if I can. Um, although that actually has been shown to be pretty sensitive for, for rolling out torsion, but we're not really, this isn't the cremasteric reflex podcast, so we'll focus more on <laughs> the God. ultrasound <laughs> part of it. Uh, so this is actually a guy, uh, you all may have seen the story, he's a baseball player, Chris Snyder, who actually did have a rupture from a foul tip. Um, he's a catcher, um, he's actually sliding into home here, but he actually is a catcher, that's how he got a rupture, so kids out there, uh, wear your cups. Um, and so this was he is, not wearing a cup, is that what happened? He, yeah, exactly, he's a catcher in Major League Baseball and he was not wearing a you know, I, I assumed that, he may have been, but I, I think he was not wearing a cup. But anyway, this is what it looks like. This is a, a uh, testicular rupture. So what am I looking at here, Matt? So you're looking at a testicle. Thank you. And it's ruptured. You see how it's very, very heterogeneous. Uh, it's not the round, nice testicle that we like to see on ultrasound. Yeah. And it's just got kind of a characteristic B-mode appearance. Uh, pretty simple, just kind of look at it, and it's obviously messed up. Fair right. enough. Is that what all that fluid around it is from? So that's fluid and edema from the swelling. There's probably some blood in there as well. And so how do you treat this? What do you do? Uh, ice packs and ibuprofen. So if it was a contusion, that would be great. But rupture, this actually needs exploration. They need to go in and fix this. And that may not be completely intuitive. Uh, <laughs> what are you laughing at, Mike? The <laughs> that may not be completely intuitive. 
but it actually is pretty important. What happens is if you have rupture of the tunica albuginea just around the testicle, then your body can actually form an immune response and attack your testicle, Whoa. which you don't want to do. That sounds not awesome. So that's good. that needs to be fixed. You you could lose not only the function of that testicle, but then also the other as well because of the immune response, and uh, you could be sterile from that. So you mentioned ice packs and things like that. Now, if it is a contusion, if you don't see this this obvious rupture here, so if it's a well formed testicle, yes, circular and all that, yes, then okay. you're exactly right. The management is ice elevation, conservative treatment. Uh, support, uh, Mike. This picture of you here. Where did you get this support? Where can someone pick something like that, like that up? <laughs> I think I just got it at Walmart. Okay. All right. Great. So that that that's what you do for contusion. What about the other things? These are the things we really want to talk about more: torsion, orchitis, and epididymitis. And it really is all about the flow when it comes to these things. Torsion has less flow or no flow, and orchitis and epididymitis have more flow. And that's why ultrasound really is so useful in these diagnoses. They can present very similar quite often, but the way you really differentiate them is not exactly by the history and physical, but the flow on ultrasound. Uh, of course, there are going to be some differences in, in history. For example, orchitis and epididymitis are usually going to be slower onset pain, but frequently patients will have maybe pain for a little while, but then they get to a threshold and they kind of report it as sudden pain. Uh, or there are instances of epididymitis uh, and orchitis and the swelling actually leading to a torsion. So you really can't rely on the history and physical alone. So we're going to do another case. This is a 30. This is actually a patient that I, I actually had in the last month. He's a 32-year-old swollen tender right testicle. He said it had been hurting for a couple of days, but it started hurting a lot more in the last few hours. So this is exactly what we kind of said initially it's been hurting for a few days I thought not really torsion doesn't really sound like torsion but then he said it was worse in the last few hours so what am I going to do I, I, I ultrasounded him so to talk really quick about torsion for a minute what is that well I think everybody understands pretty much it's twisting of the spermatic cord and you cut off the venous flow and then the arterial flow and then the testicle dies because it has no oxygen and no blood flow. So what we're looking for when we're evaluating for torsion is that exact thing, that blood flow. Here you see a case, this is not my patient, I'll tell you a little bit more about my patient in a minute, but here's a case of torsion. You see a right testicle here with good flow, you see all this blood flow within here, the color lights up, and then you see the left testicle with no flow. And this is a case this patient should go straight to the OR. And this is interesting, Matt. So, are, when you do this, are you putting, are you basically getting both testicles on screen at the same time? Yeah. So we're going to talk exactly about how you do this. We're going to actually show you video and go through that process. This is a picture of both. Um, actually, I'm sorry. This is two different pictures. You totally can get both testicles in a transverse lie uh, or transverse scan and look at color side by side. And if one is decreased, then great. To go to the OR, you're done. Um, however, that if, if it's not that easy, if it's not automatic like that, then you're going to want to probably follow uh, some certain steps and do it the same way each time to be a little more sensitive. So we'll, we'll show we're you gonna, exactly We're going to go into more detail on that then. Yes, exactly. Good. Awesome. Before we do that, though, I think it's important to ask a question, can we do this? Is ultrasound good enough? Is it really better than the history and physical? And this is just, these are some numbers from just radiology performed ultrasound in general. These are a couple recent studies, a couple big studies looking at the sensitivity and specificity for torsion, and they're good. It's, it's mid to high 90s, 90s per, 90% uh, for these tests. So it's good enough. It's the best thing that we have. It's be better than the old uh, scintigraphy. Scintigraphy? test exactly I don't even know what that is me neither okay so you're saying so those last studies though those are these are radiology performed studies exactly okay so that's that's if I send the patient over to the radiology suite and the tech over there performs the ultrasound yes okay what if, about what about if I perform the ultrasound well that's of course that's kind of the question that we have because that that would be ideal right I mean it, it takes time to send them over to radiology and this is a time sensitive disease and I don't always have radiologists in house to do this either Exactly. Most of the hospitals that I work at do not have uh, technicians on at night. 
um, and this would be great to save this time and possibly the testicle. So unfortunately there's not a lot of great literature on that. Um, this is kind of the study that, that people do quote the one study on this and it was retrospective uh, and it was 10 years ago when it was published. Uh, these studies were performed in the 90s uh, when this was going on. Uh, Blavis, Straczynski, and Lambert, they looked back just at the, the centers where they worked and they had 36 cases of acute scrotum where they did a bedside ultrasound and then they sent the patient over to radiology for an ultrasound as well. And they had good results. 35 out of the 36 cases, the radiologist agreed with what they said. So their sensitivity for whatever, for the acute scrotal, they, they didn't really identify one disease process, was 95%. Specificity was 94%. So that's good. And you could say that they were 100% sensitive for ruling out torsion, but that would be kind of misleading. It would be better to say that they were three for three. Okay, so the 36 cases, but only three of them were torsion. Exactly. So, so that probably tells me that when there were episodes where there, or where there were case, uh, patients where they were concerned about torsion, they were sending them over for those scans typically. So they were diagnosing more orchitis or epididymitis. Well, no, that's I, I think this is that's a pretty fair represent, representation of the normal breakdown of the acute scrotum. If you want to look exactly with what they found, they found three testicular torsions, six cases of epididymitis, four orchitis, one testicular fracture, um, which is we, we've been calling it rupture, but other places call it fracture. Which I think think is a weird word. It's kind of like the the penile fracture. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, um, uh, except in this picture. Uh, but that th those are pretty. It's a pretty normal breakdown. Other studies that I've seen show that torsion does make up about 10% of the acute scrotum cases. So th this seemed like a kind of all comers general representation. It was a convenient sample and retrospective. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. paper that basically tells me if you are one of the greatest ultrasonographers in the world, then you are capable of performing the scan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> How, however, you could also say that this was done with technology 13 or 14 years ago before we had more experience with this and before we, we had, uh, I mean, the, the great machines that we have now in our department. So of course, these guys are the greatest ultrasonographers of all time, but back then they were um, using subpar machinery. So this at least tells me that this should be achievable. Yes. So yes. this is this is something to strive to. I think so. We don't have the literature to really, really back us up yet on this, but, but I, I think we can do it. Now, to talk really quickly about orchitis, uh, orchitis, we already mentioned, is increased flow. This is... Uh, an infection of the actual testicle itself, usually spreading from the epididymis. And you can see here all this increased flow. So the patient that I had that we talked about, the case, actually had orchitis. So we looked at his good testicle, which we're going to show you a video of how to do all this very soon. Uh, we adjusted our flows where we had good color flow on the unaffected testicle. Then we moved over to the swollen tender testicle, and he had just all kinds of crazy flow in his testicle and in his epididymis and I felt great I felt like that was um, kind of good enough for me this guy had orchitis gave him antibiotics and he didn't get a uh, radiology performed scan so that's orchitis uh, pretty simple just increased flow tender swollen right, so orchitis increased flow I think I can handle that all right what about what if I told you epididymitis was also just increased flow would you be happy with that is it just increased flow in the epididymis? Yeah, so epididymitis and orchitis are kind of a spectrum. Usually orchitis comes from epididymitis. I mean, this is an ascending infection. You get the, the infection coming in, uh, infecting the epididymis, and then the testicle itself. So it's a very similar thing. It's just kind of increased flow along the epididymis. You usually see it in the epididymal head, um, but it can be isolated to the other parts of the epididymis as well. So what you're looking at right here in this epididymitis uh, scan is a sagittal view. So when I say that, what I mean by that, and we'll demonstrate it uh, very soon, is you're looking at, the, you're putting the probe on the testicle up and down, and you're getting a cut just like this illustration here, where you've got the testicle on the top or here where the epididymis is superior. And so if we have our probe marker up towards the head, then on the left side of the screen is where you're going to see the epididymis. So that's the area where I'm looking for increased flow. Exactly. And now, is it just more flow than the, the testicle? 
Is that all I'm looking at? Am I comparing it to just the testicle, or am I comparing it to the other side? So this is like a ton of ultrasound we do, like the musculoskeletal or other things, where it's really nice that there's two right there together, so we can compare them. So always start with a good one. Uh, adjust everything so you, you get a nice picture of the good testicle and epididymis, and then move over to the other side. Okay, gotcha. Here's another picture of just kind of increased flow. You see a epididymal head there, and again, this is a sagittal view. You've got testicle, you have promark towards the head. This is towards the feet, and so kind of superior posterior is your epididymis and epididymal head. So all that inflammation from the infection is just kind of causing the 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 testicle or the epididymis to get uh, be sort of uh, hyperemic or increased flow basically. exactly and it's going to have some it's going to look a little different um, with some swelling and things from the other side on B mode and after you see a few you may be able to recognize it that way as well but the color is definitely much easier to appreciate gotcha so let's do it let's uh, actually show you some videos of, of how to do this before we do that though. A uh, little gotcha again. You, you, I know everybody's so excited to see some testicles scanned, but we'll uh, let's talk really quickly just so everybody understands. We're using the linear or small parts probe. Um, which of those two things you call it, I think, depends on the mood you're in and if you like your like your patient or not. If they're giving you a really hard time, then uh, you may refer to it as even the tiny parts probe or, or whatever. But for most patients, I would for for good doctor-patient relationships, I would refer to it as the linear probe. Patient positioning, um, <laughs> I don't know if you really need a picture here, but we're going to give you one anyway. Of uh, You, you want to get the patient comfortable. This is, this is kind of important. I mean, think about it. If, uh, if it was your testicle that was hurting that bad and you were worried about it, it's not just the pain, but also the psychological um, injury from, <laughs> from this. You want to get them comfortable. You want to support the scrotum with you some create a, create a good sling. That's right, a nice sling as, as it's referred to here. Some padding underneath there, get them nice and comfortable. It, they're kind of frog legging out here, so you even maybe want to put some pillows underneath their knees there to support them. Uh, get them really comfortable and tell them exactly what you're going to do and do everything very slowly. So unfortunately, fifty dollars was not enough to lure a testicular model. We even increase it to sixty. Then we offered to give them 70 for shaved testicles. Then we even offered to throw in the razor, let them keep it, buy it ourselves. But none of that was enough, so unfortunately we're going to show you on a model how to do this. So with ultrasound of the testicles, it's the same as any ultrasound modality. You want to have a system, you want to do it the same way every time so you're consistent and don't miss anything. So we're going to demonstrate on the model here. Uh, we tried to find a lifelike model, but all we had were these miniature ones, so we'll have to demonstrate on that. So. The first thing, as we mentioned, is patient positioning. You want to take the penis, fold it up onto the abdomen, the chest, uh, throw it over the shoulder, whatever you need to do. Get it out of the way, put a towel over it. Then when you're scanning, you place the probe on the testicle. You want to start with the unaffected side. Uh, you want to see what their normal testicle looks like first. You're going to start in the longitudinal plane with the probe marker up. So remember the epididymis is posterior lateral, so when you have the probe in this position, on the ultrasound screen, it's going to be on the left of the screen because you have your pro marker towards the head and it's going to be on the bottom part of the screen, inferior. So once you've located that and scanned through that completely, you're also scanning through the testicle in this plane, then you're going to want to turn 90 degrees and scan completely through in this axis. After you've scanned through in B mode, you're going to want to turn the color on. You're on the good testicle here, so you're going to adjust the color until you just have color flow in the testicle. You're going to use this to compare to the other side to make sure there's good flow. So after you're done on that side and you've got the color adjusted, you're going to move to the affected side, the painful side. Uh, the same orientation, longitudinal first. Take a look at the epididymis and see what the color flow is like in the epididymis compared to the other one. You're going to scan through the same way, completely through. You're going to scan through in the other plane, in the axial plane. Uh, completely through. If you're having trouble finding flow in the testicle, um, especially on the good testicle, you may want to use the power Doppler button. Uh, if you hit that, you're going to get the, an image similar to this, and it helps pick up slow flow. It doesn't give you any information on direction, but you don't really care when you're looking at the testicles. You just want to know if there's flow or not. Uh, and then you're going to turn the color on at that point if it's not on with the same settings you had on the good side and compare the flow. 
Obviously, increased flow is you're thinking orchitis or epididymitis, and decreased flow you're thinking probably torsion. Also, after you've done all that, it's very helpful a lot of times if you can kind of squeeze the testicles together, uh, get both of the testicles in the field of view at the same time under the probe. If you have this, you're able to directly compare the color of both at the same time as you're able to expand the color box and get it on both testicles. This can be really helpful. So we're getting ready to tell you a little bit about spectral Doppler as well. So after you've evaluated for color flow in general, you may or may not want to use some spectral Doppler. If you do, here's how you do that. You're going to place the probe on the testicle. You're going to find an area of blood flow. And once you do, to do spectral Doppler, you're going to use the pulse wave button on the machine. You're going to uh, hit the pulse wave, get the gate right over an area of flow, and then hit the pulse wave button again, and you're going to get a waveform and be able to tell if it's venous or arterial. With testicular torsion frequently, the venous uh, blood flow will disappear first, so you really want to have venous and arterial flow to completely rule out testicular torsion. Spectral Doppler pulse wave. Now at this point you're probably saying, come on, if you're going to start talking about spectral Doppler and pulse wave, then forget it. I'm going to leave this scan to the urologist and the radiologist, but calm down, hold on, wait just a second. I'm not saying you have to do this, I'm just showing you how to do it. So I don't think I can say the word testicle anymore. So we're going to take a break, we're going to come back next time, and we're going to talk a little bit, bit more about this spectral Doppler thing. We're going to discuss if it's really important, if you really have to do it, or if it's just something you can do if you need to. And then, more importantly, we're going to give you some concrete algorithms and ways that you can use this. One a little more complex and one pretty simple, so that you can decide for yourself how to use this in your clinical practice. not good enough at ultrasound that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation get out there ultrasounds some hearts some lungs some ivcs let us know how you feel about it